Hi, I'm Emily and I am here with Maya Murphy's attorney, H. Daniel Murphy. Attorney Murphy practices at Maya Murphy's offices in both New York and Connecticut. My question today for attorney Murphy is, how do I know how much child support I will pay or receive? So that's a question that we feel quite often. Child support in Connecticut is awarded uh, to a parent or, or actually to parents for the care of minor children. And here in Connecticut, the age of majority or emancipation from child support, call it, is either 18 or until the child graduates from high school, whichever is later, but in no event past the age of 19. So it's a formulaic approach and the formula and table that we follow for guidance is called not surprisingly, the Connecticut Child Support Guidelines. Essentially, to, to get the guideline uh, child support number, the court looks to the combined net income of the parties. So that's the, the combined amount that the, that the parties, the parents, take home each week in their pay. And the court uses that number to figure out a basic child support obligation. And that varies by income and by number of children. So there's a table that the court looks at and the attorneys look at when they're calculating this thing. And, and, and the percentages will obviously be higher for more children, going up from 10% on the low side to over 50% of the combined net income. And the percentages also slide down as income goes up. So the presumption is that the more a couple earns, the less is actually needed to go to the basic support of the children of the parties. Um, the more income that's available to the parties as they earn more basically is it becomes discretionary income that can be used for other things. It doesn't have to go to the necessities for the children. So the guidelines, when you put the combined net income of the parties into this table, they essentially come up with a presumptive basic weekly support obligation. And that obligation is then split between the parents according to what share of the total net income that each person earns. So it's divided pro rata between the parents based on their earnings at that time. So each parent, not just one parent, each parent has a support obligation figure after you divide it up by them, uh, by, by income. So the, the primary residence of the, of the uh, children essentially determines which party pays the other. So the, the non-residential quote unquote parent is going to be paying their child support figure to the residential parent if indeed that the child support is in accordance with the guidelines that I just described. So the number is derived from the Connecticut child support guidelines, but is the guideline always followed? So the Connecticut child support guidelines are called guidelines exactly for that reason. They are guidelines. There, is a, there, is a, there are a number of, of discretionary factors that the court can consider to either go above the guidelines or below the guidelines on a child support award. And those are called deviation criteria, reasons why child support should be different than the number that is essentially uh, derived from, the, from looking at the table. So one of these deviation criteria is a shared parenting plan. Um, that is, you know, some people call it a 50-50 parenting plan. It's, it's not always the case where a shared or a 50-50 parenting plan or shared physical custody means that there is no child support being paid one way or another. That's a common misconception. Um, it's something that a lot of parties think about and talk about when they're seeking a particular parenting plan, thinking that they don't have to pay child support as long as the parenting time is equally split. Um, it is the case, however, that a shared parenting plan in some circumstances might be a very good reason to deviate from the guidelines somewhat to account for this, to account for the fact that, that there really is no quote-unquote non-residential parent. And as a result of that, um, the, the, the guideline amount might be inapplicable or, or doesn't make sense in that particular instance. There are other reasons to deviate as well. Sometimes there are extraordinary expenses for a particular child. Um, or there are other resources, maybe large resources, available to a parent from some other source, um, maybe family support of some kind. Maybe there's an extraordinary disparity in income that's, uh, that uh, would make following the guidelines inequitable. Or maybe a parent has some particular unusual needs for other dependents. And there are more factors that a court can use or look to for deviation criteria other equitable factors, um, and these should always be discussed with an experienced family law attorney um, when, you're, when you're considering what you might expect in a child support obligation. Finally, the parents uh, and the parties should understand that child support does not cover everything. 
it does not cover all the expenses related to a child's care. Extracurricular expenses in Connecticut are usually outside and above and beyond a child support obligation. Um, unreimbursed medical expenses, those expenses not covered by insurance, those are typically shared in some way that's based on, again, somewhat of a formulaic approach based on available income after child support is taken out. And qualified daycare expenses are, are also um, expenses that are usually above and beyond child support. And they're shared somehow proportionally to income for, for uh, a qualified, uh, for a daycare expense to be a qualified daycare expense. I'm speaking about uh, expenses for daycare that are usually incurred for a party to go back to work and earn income somewhere else. So for any of these deviation criteria to apply in your particular case and to know whether or not your case is one where you would be likely to depart or deviate from the child support guidelines, you should certainly speak with a, an experienced family law attorney on this subject. Thank you.